What's up my pre-calc people? In this video, we're gonna talk about the fourth and final free response question on the AP pre-calculus exam. Now the College Board has laid out an awesome framework for exactly what this question is gonna look like, and we're gonna talk about that framework in this video, and then we're gonna look at a full example that follows that framework that was given in the course exam description. Now here's what I can promise you. When you open up the AP pre calyx exam free response section in May and you get to that fourth and final FRQ, it's not gonna look identical to the problem that we're gonna talk about in this video. But the framework for the question will be identical. That's what I could promise you. So the more you practice questions exactly like this one, the better off you're gonna be. And that's exactly why I wanna show you this question in this video. But I also have many more examples of a question four in my ultimate review packet. So the more you prepare, the more you study, the more you do problems just like this, the better off you'll be. That way when you do open up the exam, yes, you won't know exactly what the question is gonna look like, but you'll know exactly what to expect and you will be 100% prepared. All right, let's start talking about that problem right now. In the fourth FRQ for the AP Pre-Calculus exam, you're gonna be dealing with symbolic manipulation of functions. Now you're gonna be presented with several different functions, could be exponential, logarithmic, trigonomic, or inverse trigonomic functions, and you cannot use a calculator. Now there's gonna be three parts. Two parts of the question require students to solve equations using given functions. So you better know how to solve exponential, you better know how to solve logarithmic, and you better know how to solve trigonomic functions. The third part of the question requires students to rewrite given function expressions in different forms. So here we're going to be taking a function they give us and, well, making it look different using different ways that we've learned throughout the year. So in this question, students must determine the exact value of expressions that can be obtained without a calculator. Again, you've got to be able to solve. Use algebraic, me algebraic methods and rules for exponents and logarithms to combine terms. Show the work that leads to their answers in each part of the question. Now, here are the directions to this problem. So this is just making sure that you know how everything should be expressed, how all of your answers could look, making sure everything's nice and perfect. And just, you know, take a minute to read this. But hopefully your teachers in class have actually been showing you this kind of setup as well for this fourth and final FRQ. All right, let's take a look at an example of exactly what I'm talking about. All right, so part A, two functions are given, G and H. Now, part A has two parts. Rewrite g of x as a single natural log with natural logarithmic, bleh, excuse me, rewrite g of x as a single natural logarithm without negative exponents in any part of the expression. Your result should be of the form natural log of an expression. And then we're going to rewrite h of x as an expression in which cosine of x appears once and there's no other trigonomic functions are involved. Okay, so let's do part one first. We need to rewrite g of x with only one natural log. All right, so this is just going to be some of our basic combining rules. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the values out in front up. So this three, this is the power rule, is gonna move up here as my power. The one half is gonna move up here as my power. Then I have the subtraction of two natural logs, so I could condense that down with division. So I'm gonna do the natural log of x cubed divided by x to the one half. Okay, it's a pretty easy rule. Then I'm actually gonna use my exponent rule to reduce this inside portion. I just wanna reduce this inside portion, and you guys should know that rule. We just subtract our exponents when we're dividing with the same base. So three minus one half is five halves. Three is six halves, six halves minus one half is five halves. So there we go, there we got a final answer with one natural log. Again, natural log, and then inside that natural log is a nice, simple expression, x to the five halves. Now, some kids will say, oh, can I, can I write that as the square root of x to the fifth? I mean, sure, knock your socks off, but you don't have to. It wants you to actually just leave it just like that. Okay, so I want to show you that there actually is a second way to do this problem. You know, you know, there's always different ways to do things, and maybe your teacher taught you something different here. Now, in some ways, some kids might say this is actually easier. But basically, we have three natural logs minus a half of a natural log. Well, that's like three apples minus a half apples. If you have three apples and you subtract a half an apple, you have five halves apples. So I basically have like terms here, three natural logs, one half natural log, so that's five halves natural logs. Then I could take and use the power rule that five halves could come up as my power there and I get that same final answer that we got earlier. So as long as you get that same final answer, it doesn't really matter how you get there. So two different ways there. All right, 
Now, the other thing I have to make sure I mention here is I do need to add a requirement on here that X must be greater than zero. Now that's because right here, when I use that condensing rule to put that X to the one half in a denominator, that's basically a square root in a denominator. Now in a square root, X has to be positive or equal to zero, but when it's in the denominator, that now means that I can't even be zero. So I do have this restriction on my final answer that X has to be greater than zero. All right, now for the second part of part A, they want me to rewrite h of x as a single cosine. No other trigonomic functions involved. All right, this one's actually quite easy. So here is my simple work for this. The numerator sine squared minus one can turn into a negative cosine squared using my Pythagorean identities. And then all of a sudden I could reduce a cosine squared over a cosine reduces just to a single cosine with that negative. So there's my final answer, negative cosine of X. Now, again, I have to add another restriction here that cosine of X cannot be zero because I have a cosine of X in my denominator and you're not allowed to have zero in denominators. So I have to make sure that cosine of X cannot equal zero. It's like a restriction on my answer. Now I, oh, Hopefully you understand how I did this. I mean, look at it. It took me two steps. That was quite simple. But some kids might say, well, I have no idea how you did that. Where did that come from? Well, let me explain. I was using the Pythagorean identity here that cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. And I did a little bit of manipulation with it. I subtracted the one to this side to produce a sine squared minus one, which is what I saw in that numerator. But to solve for that, I'm now going to subtract the cosine squared over. So when I subtract that cosine squared over, I get sine squared minus one equals co negative cosine squared, which allowed me to make that change right there. And then if you want to, you could look at that as negative cosine of X times another cosine of X. And that is how the cosine of X in the denominator reduces right there. This could reduce, reduce away. And I just get that final answer of negative cosine of X. Actually quite simple. All right. Part B wants me to do a little bit of solving here. So the functions J and K are given. So I got two brand new functions. This is so fun. And the first one wants me to solve for J of X equals zero on the interval zero to pi over two. And the second part here wants me to solve K of X equals three E. So let's do that first part. All right, so first they want to figure out where is j of x equal to zero. So of course, I'm going to turn that j of x into a zero. Now, the first thing I notice right here is that I could do a little bit of factoring. Factoring is fun because now I could use the zero product rule. But both of the terms, two sine cosine and minus cosine, both those terms have a cosine of x. So I factored it out. So two sine cosine divided by that cosine I factored out produced a two sine. Negative cosine divided by that cosine I factored out produced a negative one. So here I go. I got cosine of x times two sine of x minus one. All right. Now what I can do is use the zero product property because I have two values, cosine of x multiplied by two sine of x minus one. And the zero product property says that when you have two things multiplied that equal zero, one of those two things must be zero. So the first is that cosine of x could equal zero. And that is a very simple equation to solve. That means x equals pi over two. Now you might say, well, what about three pi over two? Or what about any other coterminal angles? Well, remember, they want me to only give answers on the interval zero to pi over two. All right, then I got the two sine of x minus one that could also be equal to zero. Add the one, divide by two, I get sine of x equals a half. Now, hopefully you might have to think about that a little bit. You might even have to draw a little unit circle to solve for that, but hopefully you pretty quickly get pi over six. Are there more answers? Actually, there's infinite answers, but remember we're on the interval zero to pi over two, and the only answer in that interval is pi over six. So there you go. That was actually a pretty easy trig equation to solve. All right, the next part of part B wanted me to solve K of X equals three E. So the first thing I'm gonna do is turn that K of X into a three E and solve. All right, so I'm going to add this E over to the other side. So that gives me four E on the left side. Then I'm gonna divide both sides by four and I get E equals two E to the three X. Now, how do I solve this for X? Well, there's two ways and I'm gonna show them both to you and you pick out which one you like best. All right, so here's the first way. I'm going to use the definition of a logarithm. Now, this is where I'm, kids might be like, what? Hold on a minute, what are you talking about? Remember, logs are inverses of exponential functions. So essentially the rule is this, right? W to the X equals Y. This can be written as log base W of Y equals X. You always equal your exponent. So basically what I was trying to do here is find a way that I could equal my exponent 
um, on the, whoop, excuse me here, on the left-hand side. The left-hand side, the exponent is one. So I said, okay, well, that's going to require a natural log because I have a base of V. E, so that's natural log. And I equal my exponent of one. And inside that natural log is going to go the two E to the three X. So that's exactly how I arrived at this statement right here. All I was doing, all I was doing was taking my exponential equation and turning it into a logarithmic equation. It's that simple. I'm using a natural log because my base right here is an E. My exponent is one. That's why I equal one. And then on the inside of my natural log is the part on the right hand side, two E to the three X. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and use some of my logarithmic rules. I'm going to break up that multiplication with log of 2 plus log of e to the 3x. I'm then going to use the power rule. I'm going to bring down that 3x in front, natural log of 2 plus 3x, natural log of e. And then this is awesome because the natural log of e is 1. And again, if you don't know that, just go ahead and think about it. Say, okay, um, e so if I don't know the answer, my base is E. So E raised to what equals E? Well, 1. E raised to 1 equals E. So natural log of E is just 1. So 3X times 1 is just 3X. Then I'm going to now solve for X. And this is pretty simple. Natural log of 2 is just a number. So I'm going to subtract it over. I get 1 minus the natural log of 2. And then I'm going to divide by the 3 in front of that X. So I get a final answer of 1 minus the natural log of 2, all divided by 3. There it is. Not too bad. And obviously, you could go to your calculator and get a decimal approximation for that if you want. But again, it's not too bad. But the, the tricky part for some kids to see is how I went from the exponential equation to a logarithmic equation. But what I want to show you right now is there's actually a second way I could do that. Now, again, I stopped right here. But I could actually do something different. I could divide by 2. And I get e divided by 2 equals e to the 3x. Then what I could do is I could, again, turn this exponential equation into a logarithmic equation. Now, how would I do that? Well, this time I'm going to be looking at this side. My base is E, so I'm going to use a natural log. A natural logs equal their exponent. My exponent is 3x. What goes in that natural log is E divided by 2. So that's exactly how I arrived at this statement right here. I just simply took that equation that was an exponential equation and I rewrote it, rewrote it, rewrote it as a natural log. Again, my base was right here is e. That's why I'm using a natural log. I equal my exponent of 3x, and then inside my natural log is the e over 2. All right, so now again, I'm going to use my um, log rules. I'm going to have that division that I'm going to separate with subtraction. So natural log of E minus the natural log of 2. Then I'm going to decide, oh, wait a minute, natural log of E is 1. So I could turn that into a 1. That's pretty nice. And then all I have to do is divide by 3, and I get 1 minus natural log of 2, all divided by 3. The same answer I got over here as I got over here. Not too bad. Hopefully that makes a lot of sense. And I actually want to show you a third way to get this answer. Now, I know you might be like, oh my gosh, seriously? But I really want to give you options and really kind of teach you the different ways that you could solve this, these um, exponential equations with logarithmic equations. All right, so remember, this is where I left off in the very beginning. Hopefully, it was very easy to get here. Another thing I could do is divide both sides by E. So I get 1 equals 2 E to the 3X minus 1. Once again, when you got these same uh, bases, you could subtract their exponents, so 3x minus 1. Now I'm going to divide by 2, and I get 1 half equals e to the 3x minus 1. And then again, what I could do is I could turn this exponential statement into a logarithmic statement. I'm going to use a natural log because my base is e. You always equal your exponents. I'm going to equal a 3x minus 1, and then inside that natural log is going to be the 1 half. Okay, then I'm going to take the natural log of 1 half, and I'm going to add 1. And then I'm going to divide everything by 3. So I get another answer, 4x. x equals the natural log of 1 half plus 1 all divided by 3. Now you might be like, wait a minute. That doesn't look the same as the other answers you got a minute ago. It is. Trust me, it's exactly the same. Let me prove it to you. Right, here it is. I'm going to separate that natural log of 1 half. I, that's division, right? 1 divided by 2 is division. So that's going to be the natural log of 1 minus the natural log of 2 plus 1, all divided by 3. The natural log of 1 is 0. 
e raised to zero equals one, so that's zero. So I just get negative the natural log of two plus one all divided by three. And that is the exact same thing I got the other two methods because that numerator could be rewritten as one minus the natural log of two. As long as the one is still positive and the natural log of two is still negative, it's the same thing. And there I go, I get the exact same answer. Now, I just showed you three ways. You pick which one you like the best. I don't know, but they all involve taking an exponential equation and writing it as a logarithmic equation. All depends how you see it. All right, now let's look at part C. We're given the function m is given by m of x equals cosine of 2x plus 4. They want us to find all input values in the domain of m that would yield an output of 9 halves. So they basically want me to figure out, if I want to figure out what output values of 9 half, what x's will produce those output values of 9 half. All right, so here I go. I'm going to simply replace the m of x with a 9 halves, and I'm going to solve. First thing I'm going to do is subtract that 4 to the other side, and 9 halves minus 4 is 1 half. 4 is 8 halves, 9 halves minus 8 halves is 1 half. Okay, now this is actually simple. You guys should like this one. This is not too, too bad. All right, now I'm thinking this is just an angle, right? 2x, that's just an angle. So I'm thinking, okay, what angle will allow the cosine value to be 1 half? Well, the first one that comes to mind is pi over 3. So 2x equals pi over 3. The angle inside, that's the 2x, equals pi over 3. If this was right here, was pi over 3, cosine of pi over 3 is 1 half. Okay, but I have to adjust because it wants me to find all values in the domain. So I'm going to add 2 pi k, which basically means every coterminal angle. So if I take pi over 3, add a circle, add a circle, add 2 pi, add 2 pi, add 2 pi, or subtract 2 pi, then I'm going to get more and more and more answers. So again, that's why k just as represents any integer. But now I want to solve for x. I remember it was 2x. I, I was thinking that this was an angle, but I got 2x and I want to know what x is. So I'm going to divide everything by 2 or basically multiply everything by 1 half that's going to turn that into a pi over 6 plus pi k. Pi over 3 times a half is pi, pi over 6, and then 2 pi k times 1 half is pi k. So here is my final answer that's going to represent all of the solutions that are going to produce that. But guess what? I'm not done yet, because if you know your unit circle very well, there are there is another angle on that unit circle that produces a cosine value of 1 half. So once again, I'm thinking about this 2x as an angle. I'm thinking, what angle could produce a cosine value of 1 half? Well, 5 pi over 3. Here it is right here. So that 2x right here could be a 5 pi over 3 because cosine of 5 pi over 3 is a half. But again, I have to add on that 2 pi k to represent that I, any coterminal angle, adding 2 pi, subtracting 2 pi as many times as you want, would produce more and more solutions. But I'm not done yet because, again, there was a 2x inside of there, and I want to just solve for x. So I basically have to multiply everything by 1 half in order to solve for x, and I get 5 pi over 6 plus pi k. So here are my two final solutions x equals pi over 6 plus pi k, and x equals 5 pi over 6 plus pi k. So here it is. That was FRQ number 4. Notice two parts I had to solve. In this case, part B I was solving, part C I was solving, and then in part A I was doing some type of manipulations to rewrite my functions. Now, the directions don't say that A is always going to be this, and then B and C are always going to be this, but again, of the three parts, two of them are going to involve solving, in this case B and C, and one of them is going to involve rewriting with different representations, and that was part A. So, not too bad. I know that this last trig one here might be a little bit tough, but again, hopefully you practice a lot of trig solving in class, and therefore this problem wasn't overall too, too bad. All right, that's it for question number four. Hope you do well on the AP exam.